We will continue reading from Chaitanya Charitamrita Adi Lila, Chapter 3, Text 98. Jaya Jaya Sri Chaitanya Jaya Nityananda. Jaya Advaita Chandra Jaya Gaura Bhakta Vrinda. Jaya Jaya Sri Chaitanya Jaya Nityananda. Jaya Advaita Chandra Jaya Gaura Bhakta Vrinda. Jaya Jaya Sri Chaitanya Jaya Nityananda. Jaya Advaita Chandra Jaya Gaura Bhakta Vrinda. Loka Gati Deke Acharya Karuna Hridaya Vichara Karena Lokera Kai Chehita Haya. Seeing the activities of the world, the Acharya felt compassion and began to ponder how he could act for the people's benefit. So we have been reading how at that time people were not interested at all in spiritual life. They were just performing uh, ritualistic activities. And so Advaita Acharya, being so compassionate, wanted to see how he could help everyone. That's the pure devotee. He's very compassionate on the suffering souls because he knows that they are suffering. They might, because the pure devotee says, oh, everyone thinks they're enjoying, but actually they're suffering. So let me connect them to Krishna. This sort of, and what is that suffering? Because we are thinking we are the body. We are not situated in our original position of eternal servant of Krishna. So, and then that's why we are uh, subjected to this birth, death, old age and disease. So a pure devotee, what he's saying, hey, this is not your home. This is not your true identity. Go back home to, to the spiritual world. You do not need to have birth, death, old age and disease and you can be all happy there. This sort of serious interest in the welfare of the public makes one a bona fide acharya. And Acharya does not exploit his followers. So this is very important. Acharya does not exploit his followers. You know, it's not that some, that an, Achar, an Acharya is one who teaches by example. He's a great personality who's come. He's specifically, specifically empowered to give Krishna to others. And then he does not want anything from anyone. He does not want anything. He does not need anything from anyone. Since the Acharya is a confidential servitor of the Lord, his heart is always full of compassion for humanity in its suffering. He knows that all suffering is due to the absence of devotional service to the Lord. And therefore, he always tries to find ways to change people's activities, making them favorable for the attainment of devotion. So an Acharya, what does he want? He wants to give Krishna to everyone, give bhakti to everyone, connect everyone to Krishna. Okay. That is the qualification of an Acharya. Then he is a confidential servitor of the Lord. It's, he's already established in his relationship with Krishna. He's already in his relationship with Krishna. And that's how he's able to give Krishna to everyone. That's how his heart is so soft. There's so much compassion. So although Advaita Prabhu, Sri Advaita Prabhu himself was powerful enough to do the work as a submissive servitor, he thought that without the personal appearance of the Lord, no one could improve the fallen condition of society. So Advaita Acharya, he could have himself given bhakti to everyone. He could have himself told everyone, chant Hare Krishna, uh, speak about Krishna, hear about Krishna. But he, out of his humility, he, 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 he is a humble servant of Krishna. So he felt, no, I can't do it myself. You know, the Lord needs to come himself to do it. The situation is so, is so bad that I won't be able to do it. Krishna needs to come. In the grim clutches of Maya, the first class prisoners of this material world wrongly think themselves happy because they are rich, powerful, resourceful, and so on. So we are, we are thinking, you know, I'm so rich, so I'm so happy. I'm, in a, I'm, uh, I'm affiliated to such a great family, so I'm happy. Then I have so much resources on hand. So, you know, I have so many things that I can use and, and misuse and manipulate. And so I'm so happy. I have so much education. And so I'm so happy. That's what we are thinking. We are thinking. And, but what are we caught? 
we're wrongly thinking happy. We are wrongly thinking we are happy because these things are all temporary. They are just related to the body. Even in the lifetime, it doesn't stay with us. Even during the lifetime, sometimes we see these things don't stay with us. You know? And then what? We are called first-class prisoners of the material world. We are a prisoner because we cannot leave our, by our own will. As a prisoner is subjected to the laws of the prison, similarly, we are subjected to the laws of the material world. Nobody likes to be, uh, become old or get disease or die, but we are forced to. We have to accept that law. So we are a prisoner. Same, like if we want to stay in a country, we follow some rules and regulations. So in this material world, we want to stay here, we have to follow the rules and regulations. These foolish creatures do not know that they're nothing but play dolls in the hands of material nature. And that any moment, material nature's pitiless intrigues can crush to dust all their plans for god godless activities. You know, we, we really don't know. For example, the earthquake last night, you know, if it could, if it was longer, what would have happened? You know, any moment anything can happen. It, it was, thankfully, you know, it was a short one, but if it was longer, what would have happened? I mean, we can't do anything to it. So we are a prisoner in the material world. Such foolish prisoners cannot see that, however, they improve their position by artificial means. The calamities of repeated birth, death, disease, and old age are always beyond the jurisdiction of their control. So we are trying to improve. Yes, we say, okay, it's so difficult to transport. Let me make the motor car. Let me make aeroplanes, the high-speed rail, and uh, you know, ships and all that. But what are we doing in return? What are we doing? And sure, travel becomes very easy. It's so much more convenient to get from one place to another. But what's happening? Then we get this global warming, spoiling the environment. Yet, but that's not the real problem. The real problem is not that it's taking me very long to go from one place to another, or it's such a difficult journey. The real problem is that I'm gonna get old, I'm gonna get disease, and I'm gonna die. And after I die, I'm going to take another birth. So we are not able to identify what is the real problem. You know, foolish as they are, they neglect these major problems of life and busy themselves with false things that cannot help them solve their real problem. So we are just thinking some things as problems, whereas what's the real problem? Oh, I am going to get old. No matter what I do, I can't stop it. Oh, I'm going to get the disease for sure, you know? Oh, I, I have to leave this body. I'm going to die. Then, but what to do? How can I stop this? That is our real problem. And But we don't want to look into that. How can I stop this birth and death? Then we are not wanting to find that. So that's why we are called foolish. Foolish. They know that they do not want to suffer death or the pangs of disease and old age. but under the influence of the illusory energy, they are grossly negligent and therefore do nothing to solve the problems. This is called Maya. So this is Maya. We are in illusion thinking, I am this body. That I'm going to continue staying in this body all along. I'm never going to die. Although we say, yeah, yeah, I'm going to die, but we don't take it seriously. We think we are going to live in the body all along. And, and we are thinking of ourselves separate from Krishna. That is Maya. We think, I am separate from Krishna. Okay, People held, but when we say separate, what does it mean? That, uh, what is our original position? We are part and parcel of Krishna. We are eternally related to Krishna. We are not Krishna, but we are parts of Krishna. So people held in the grip of Maya are thrown into oblivion after death. And as a result of their karma in the next life, they become dogs or gods, although most of them become dogs. To become gods in the next life, they must engage in the devotional service of the Supreme Personality of Godhead. Otherwise, they are sure to become dogs or hogs in terms of the laws of nature. So when it's mentioned gods, what does it mean? Oh, that there are many gods? No, God is one. But these gods are like the demigods. 
You know, the Supreme Personality of Godhead is one. And, and then uh, there are many demigods in Surya, Chandra, Indra. You know, those are all demigods, Lord Brahma, Lord Shiva. So based on our activity, what we are doing in this life, uh, we can, next body, we can take of a hog, dog, or a god. Now, what is said that mostly everyone will become a dog. Why? Because not engaging in bhakti. Only when we get engaged in bhakti can we actually stand a chance to actually become a demigod. Hmm? Because demigods are all devotees of Krishna. All the demigods are devotees of Krishna. We see Brahma, Lord Shiva, they are the greatest of the demigods. And they are pure devotees of Krishna. They are Mahajans. So then what's going to happen to everyone? Because how many people are engaging in bhakti? And then we are doing karma. And then so where will we go in the next life? So we should give this knowledge to others to save people. That, oh, where, the next, where, where will they be in the next life? You know? The third class prisoners being less materially opulent than the first class prisoners endeavor to imitate them. For they also have no information of the real nature of the imprisonment. Thus, they are also misled by the illusory material nature. So what it is, oh, if, uh, if somebody does not have, maybe does not have good education or does not have a, uh, not, is not beautiful or is not having wealth or not in a good family. So we call third class prisoner. And then we want to have more, more beauty, more wealth, more, uh, education and we think that that is all in all but still we are going to be a prisoner we're still going to be a prisoner by even by getting these things because we are still going to be in the material world it's not going to help us get out of the material world no matter how much money we have we cannot tell krishna okay you take this money and you bring me back to the spiritual world he'll say what well, he'll look at us like you know are we foolish or all the money belongs to him anyways you know, what can we do? Only by bhakti can we get out of here. Only by hearing and chanting. So that's why it's so important. Hear, chant, hear, chant. So much stress is given. So that at least we can next life not become dog or hog, you know. And the best case scenario, we go back to Godhead. We take up the process so sincerely, so seriously. We make this life our last life. No need to come back to this material world. Thus, they are also misled by the illusory material nature. The function of the Acharya, however, is to change the activities of both the first class and third class prisoners for that, for their real benefit. So an Acharya does not say that I'm going to give all this knowledge only to the poor or only to the rich. No, it's for everyone. Or only to the beautiful and not to the ugly, or only to the ugly and not to the beautiful. No, it's for everyone. We are all the soul. All these designations are only based on the body. Acharya does not see the bodies. He just sees all of us as souls, as parts and parcels of Krishna. This endeavor makes him a very dear devotee of the Lord, who says clearly in the Bhagavad Gita that no one in human society is dearer to him than a devotee who constantly engages in his service by finding ways to preach the message of Godhead for the real benefit of the world. So we are always wanting to do good to others. You know, we like to do good to others, but what's the real good? What's the real benefit we can give others is give Krishna consciousness to others. And by doing so, we ourselves become dear to Krishna. Krishna says that to Bhagavad Gita, to those who preach this message, uh, they are very dear to me. There is no one more dear to me. He says that. So, uh, and that is the real benefit. Connecting everyone to Krishna, making, giving Krishna to others, making everyone understand that, oh, you're not the body, you're a soul, you're eternal part and parcel of Krishna. Go back home. The so-called acharyas of the age of Kali are more concerned with exploiting the resources of their followers than mitigating their miseries. So in Kalyug, we see that there's so many people who think, who claim themselves that they are gurus and there are many thousands of followers or even maybe hundreds of thousands of followers. But what do they want actually? They just want what their disciples can give them, you know? 
on a gross level or maybe even on a subtle level, name, fame, adoration, worship. But that's not what Acharya is. How is he mitigating their misery? How is he stopping them from birth, death, old age, and disease? But Sri Advaita Prabhu is an ideal Acharya who is concerned with improving the condition of the world situation. So that is a true Acharya. And we should follow such Acharyas who, are, who really care about us. They don't want anything from us, but they want to stop our suffering, mitigate their miseries. That's what the pure devotees are doing. And we just follow what they're saying. Just follow here and chant. Worship Lord Krishna. Engage in bhakti to Lord Krishna. Is that okay? Yes? Yeah, very nice. So we'll stop here for today. Any questions or comments? If no, then we'll stop here for today. Shri Chaitanya Charita Amrita Ki Jai Shla Prabhupada Ki Jai Gaur Prem Nandu Haribo Haribo